Hi, this is Soft Pop 2, and it can do quite a few refreshingly original things for a semi-modular monosynth. For example, use control voltage to invert patterns passing through a quantizer that can sequence chord changes. It can do regular synth stuff, but because it's wired quite unlike other synths, and has a unique choice of modules, it can go places regular semi-modular synths don't. For example, this forest is synthesized entirely using the default routing of the synth. And these sounds live very near regular synth sounds, depending on how you set the synth up. Even when you change its default wiring, because of the way it's set up, you can get some pretty unexpected results. It's an analog monophonic synth with digital controls that's designed to explore what happens when things aren't wired up the way they're supposed to in most synths. Kind of like the synth version of a logic puzzle. Rather than a simple linear arrangement of modules, SoftPop 2 encourages circular patching, cross mods, and feedback. Like in this pop or pixel cross mod. In this video, I'll dive deep into its waters, explore a few patch ideas, compare it to the original soft pop, and take a look at its pros and cons. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Bastel sent soft pop 2 over for review, but as always, they have no say over the content of this video. This channel is funded by viewers who subscribe to my content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and Ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Let's start with an overview before we take a look at the cross mod and feedback aspects of soft pop. Many of its elements are ones you'd find in a regular monosynth, a simple analog oscillator, a resonant multi-mode filter, and a two-stage envelope, which can also loop as an LFO. The faders work in pairs, so an oscillator frequency will have a mod depth for whatever source is modulating it, filter, and a mod depth for whatever source is modulating it, and then the envelope rate and shape. And again, if it's looping, then it's the LFO shape and rate. It's a semi-modular synth, meaning that you can rewire its modules or connect it to other semi-modular or Eurorack gear using the patch bay. Inputs are labeled white on black and outputs in reverse text. Inputs and outputs that are related to each other are connected with a line. Things are pretty well organized by module, so these are related to the oscillator, these inputs and outputs to the filter, these to the envelope, these to the sequencer, and there are a few utilities around the corners. Speaking of the sequencer, SoftPop 2 has an eight-step sequencer that can store eight banks of eight patterns each, and you can chain patterns, and these gate buttons also have multiple additional parameters like setting the scale, setting the clock division, a few sequencer effects, and more, and you access these various functions using the buttons on the left and on the right. This sequencer is a bit mightier than it seems aside from pitch. It can also sequence the mod depth, fader motion, as well as other triggered parameters, slides by default, or anything you can patch the slide output to. It can actually also sequence scale changes and pattern changes. Now, getting to all these functions is quite a shifty affair. Luckily, many of the shift combos are either printed on the panel or on the enclosure, so you don't need to reference the manual for most of the shift functions. SoftPop 2 can also accept an audio input with level control on the panel, and there's a five pin MIDI DIN input for sequencing with external gear with a couple of control modes, either playing notes directly or transposing the sequence. Where SoftPop 2 starts getting unique is in its default cross mod routing and features. 
The default modulator for the oscillator pitch is a sample and hold circuit, which samples the oscillator itself and is triggered every time the envelope is triggered or every time the envelope loops. The end result is at uh, audio rates for the oscillator, pretty much like a random pitch. And when you lower the oscillator to sub audio rates, things can get rhythmically interesting as I'll show you in a bit. Another interesting default routing that you can't change actually, and I'll set this into drone mode so you can hear it. The oscillator frequency, the mod depth, and the sequencer always go through a scale, which you can determine, one of eight scales. And you can customize these scales. And that opens up quite a few interesting opportunities. And I'll show you more of this later. The transpose input, by the way, bypasses the scalar, but is still quantized to semitones. And the only thing that isn't quantized is the fine tune slider. The second interesting cross mod is the pop function, which goes from soft, which is basically no cross mod to pixel, which cross mods the filter frequency with, again, the oscillator frequency itself. And this can get quite weird. Anywhere from formant sounds to even though this is all analog, bit crushed in digital like sounds. And then the third interesting cross mod is again between the VCO rate and the envelope rate. Now, as far as I could tell, this has a very subtle, if any, impact at higher oscillator rates. But again, if you go to sub audio rates, then you'll notice that the envelope rate gets modulated up and down based on this now as an LFO, the oscillator frequency. Finally, overall, the build seems rather solid. Maybe a little wobble here, but faders seem fine. This knob stays in place, the switches are fine. Uh, the case itself isn't exactly quite Eurorack size, so you can't mount it directly. It's powered by five volts, uh, micro USB input in the back. So presumably with a panel adapter, you could mount it in a Eurorack case, but not as is. Let's jump in a little deeper and look at its synthy bits first. The oscillator by default is a square wave. The oscillator also outputs a triangle wave, but you'll need to patch it into the filter to hear it. Notice things are being quantized. Though if I pick a scale with no notes selected, it defaults to semitone quantization. The oscillator also has PWM, which is accessible only through the panel. So you won't hear it unless we plug voltage into the PWM input. We could take this utility here, which let, lets me send voltage using this knob into PWM. And I now have some control over pulse width. I could, of course, modulate pulse width with the envelope. Here we go. Or with an external LFO, of course. Speaking of this module, it can also act as an attenuator and attenuverter, so I could pass an LFO through it and then attenuate it using the knob. If I wanted to combine the waveforms, by the way, I could do it using the input for additional bass, and uh, this circuit does clip nicely. Like I mentioned earlier, by default, the sample and hold unit is plugged in as a mod source, but again, I could connect any other source into this fader, for example the envelope, any voltage from the mod input, this slider in the sequencer goes through a quantizer. So if I picked a scale with fewer notes, you could literally hear it cycle through the notes of the scale. I didn't mention this earlier, but things that are routed by default in the patch bay have this little arrow next to them. So sample and hold into this input, for example, the envelope into the filter mod depth sequencer into the trigger and the trigger edge to trigger the sample and hold circuit. Let's move on and take a listen to the filter. In low pass mode, pretty sharp slope. Manual says 12 dB per octave seems a little bit more to me. That's without resonance and then increasing resonance doesn't reduce levels, which is nice. And yeah, this gets nice and crunchy. 
and the filter will self-oscillate. I can bypass the normal connection of the oscillator into the filter by plugging a dummy cable into the filter input. And then there are two other modes for the filter, a bandpass mode, shallower slope, and a high pass mode, with resonance, by the way. So a really nice sounding filter. I also mentioned the cross mod option using the pop function from the oscillator. Let's take a quick listen to that. From vocal formants all the way to more aggressive pixelated distortion. And then the looping envelope goes from a descending saw morphing into a triangle envelope or LFO and to a ramp goes well into audio rates and by default it's routed to the VCA but also to the filter mod depth over here Let's take a closer look at the quantizer and how you edit its notes. I'll plug the envelope into the mod depth so we cycle through the different notes in the scales. Like I mentioned, you choose a scale by holding the scale button and choosing one of the eight scale options. And then there are instructions on the side on how to edit the notes in the scale, but basically once you're in the scale, you can go up and down the various 12 semitone options and then turn notes in the scale on or off by pressing the tempo button. So in this case, C will participate in the scale if this LED is on and won't if it's off, then go to C sharp, doesn't participate, and oops, and does when I press tempo, go up by semitones, choose whether a note participates or not like this. You can actually change scales while patterns are playing. So you could say mid performance, swap from the major scale to a minor scale. And you can actually sequence scale changes. More on that in a bit. Okay, let's move on and talk about the sequencer. Each pattern can have up to eight steps. You can have eight patterns in a bank and there are a total of eight banks. Each step in a sequencer holds four bits of information. Pitch, which you can sequence using this fader, mod depth, which you can sequence using this fader, and then whether a note is triggered or not, and whether a slide is triggered or not. If I hit play, we can hear the current sequence, all eight steps. And if I wanna sequence live, I hold both pattern and slide, record, and sequence like that. And this adheres to the scale, of course. And I could sequence mod depth as well. A high mod depth with random notes doesn't sound like much. And you'll notice these little LEDs on the panel. They'll turn off when the faders don't control pitch or mod depth. Anyway, that's how you can live record notes. You can't live record notes, at least not currently using MIDI. You can also step sequence notes. So a short press on pattern and slide, which is record, will get you into step sequencing mode where you can hold the step and change its pitch. You might want to turn on drone for this. We just sequenced three steps. Let's do one more. So that's how you step sequence. You can also use these buttons as an onboard keyboard in this step sequence mode. Not an ideal way to sequence. Again, it would be nice if you could do that using the um, an external keyboard. One final way you can step sequence is by holding a gate and then pressing the up or down arrows to transpose in semitones. And this adheres to scale as well. You can press multiple times. Anyway, so that's how you sequence one pattern. And we just sequenced pattern two in this case. Let's say go to pattern three and there's nothing in here. Let's maybe do something simple in here. 
and turn on the gates. Okay, so that's pattern three. That's pattern two. You can chain patterns just by holding the button and pressing the, the patterns you want to chain. And you can chain multiple patterns like this or repeat a pattern if you like. You can actually sequence scales like this as well. So let's take this one pattern. If you hold scale and then say press scale and press another one and press another one, it will cycle through the scales in the order that I press them, effectively making this kind of like a chord sequencer. See, it isn't the patterns that are changing here, it's the scales that are being sequenced. And yeah, there's a bug in the current firmware where the first note takes its time, and sometimes an additional note will play when you hit stop. I have been told this will be fixed in the final firmware. What else? The sequencer has a few play modes. So if you hold play appropriately and press one of the eight gate buttons, this plays the pattern backwards and you can hopefully see this on camera. The LEDs blink. This plays the first four notes. And the last four notes, you can turn gates on or off. By the way, it's still cycling through the scales, which is cool. Maybe with a delay, especially. Yeah, if I want to disable cycling through the scales, just choose a scale. And it won't do that anymore. Got a few more play modes and orders. And you can sequence that as well. You can sequence play orders, so... Notice? Yeah, a lot of things you discover when you use this. So those are the various play modes. And then let's maybe go back to a simple forward motion. Another interesting feature is the temporary effects. If you hold trigger and choose one of the eight gate options, it will mess with your pattern in one of eight ways. Fast triggers or slow triggers, either octave arpeggios, long slew, noise modulation. Then a final thing about the sequencer, you can sync it to external clock. I tested it with a Volca, Analog sync works pretty nicely. It keeps up with the tempo, as it should. Softpop 2 supports a few clock divisions, which you enable by hitting tempo and choosing one of the gates. There's no MIDI out, but you can use the clock output to sync external gear that accepts analog clock. By the way, you may have noticed this psychedelic orb flashing as I play the synth. Basically, it gets RGB values from three sources in the synth. The oscillator level, so on and off based on the oscillator rate. Then it's blue based on the envelope and it turns red, I think based on the output of a bandpass filter. And obviously the colors combine based on the different sources. Let's explore Soft Pop 2 a little bit deeper by looking at a few patch ideas. The Dynamics Output is an envelope follower that follows anything coming in through the audio input. Since the envelope follower generates a positive modulation, we want to invert it and control it using the XY circuit. And at the proper settings, you can get a really nice side chain effect that will help your kicks stand out in the mix.
Next little patch idea. The pop circuit can get pretty rowdy, but we can patch the envelope either directly to control the pop CV or through the attenuverter. Out the mixer and back into pop. What this does is let us add just a bit of distortion and pixel at the beginning of the sound. So a nice controllable pop pixel. Next little tip, you can push a parameter beyond its default limits by adding voltage to it. Let's take the XY output, plug it into the envelope rate because I want it to go faster than it normally would. So by default, if you want to hear the envelope, I'll plug just it into the filter, cause it to cycle. That's about as high as it'll go. I can make it go higher by adding voltage to the rate input. well into high audio rates, but that isn't very controllable and you can't control it with CV and play with it. But if we take the pulse output of the oscillator and patch it into the trigger input of the envelope, if we set the envelope to loop, we get both a sawtooth wave and one that's impacted kind of like oscillator sync and we essentially sequence the envelope using a sequencer, play it using a sequencer to get entirely different sounds out of uh, soft pop, way beyond just a triangle and pulse oscillator. So cool stuff. Next tip, like I mentioned earlier, voltages from the mod input, the pitch slider and the sequencer are combined and passed through a scaler. This can be a great way to arpeggiate patterns as they're playing using external or internal voltage. That's basically what's going on in this patch. The envelope is an LFO, is cycling through different notes being offset by the sequencer. Next little tip, by default the play modes can give you either an eight note pattern or a four note pattern, but what if you wanted a pattern that had a different length? If you're not using the slide parameter in your patterns, you could use the slide gate to reset the pattern. So now we get a three note pattern, or we could change that to uh, yeah, any other length that we wanted. If we really wanted to use the slide, and we didn't mind that all of the notes in our pattern triggered, so remember you could disable certain notes in a pattern. But if we didn't mind that all of them triggered, we could turn all of them off, and then use the envelope gate to reset the pattern. If we turn all the gates off, we obviously can't hear the pattern, but we could use the clock to trigger the envelopes. And we essentially now freed up the envelope trigger pattern to cut the sequence short, freeing up the slide gate to make slides or anything else. You will need to disconnect the clock from the triggers to stop the sequence though. Now you can use this extra mod lane to modulate other things. So let's say for example, go into the reverse input. To reverse the envelope. In certain places in the sequence. Or um, maybe add an accent. That's a nice way to add an accent. Or anything else. Um, activate the cycle, for example, for ratchets maybe have a controlled trigger of the sample and hold circuit. Next tip, you could use the XY circuit as a crossfader and a mixer. For example, if you want to add a texture to your sound, you can mix in noise alongside the oscillator. In this case, I'm using Bataco's noise plethora, but any other tone generator or noise generator can play alongside whatever you have going on on soft pop too. 
next tip, like I mentioned to you, when you lower the oscillator rates, a few cross mods kick in, a few extra cross mods as if there weren't enough before. Let's turn on some delay. And with a bit of mucking about, you can start to see why this and its predecessor were called soft pop. It's quite easy to find these bubbly sweet spots. of extra patching, even more craziness can ensue. Before I head out to the pros and cons, a brief comparison to the good old soft pop Mark 1. You can see that it's a bit smaller, it has a built-in speaker, which really isn't necessary. It can be powered by batteries, which this soft pop can't. You need to access this inconvenient dip switch bay to cancel a few of the default cross mods, something which you don't need to do on soft pop too. You can override the normalized settings just by plugging dummy cables into the inputs. All the settings, by the way, except the cross mod from the oscillator to the envelope at low rates. This patch bay obviously required these little wires to plug in here, which isn't as convenient as proper patch jacks. You did have an interface to modular using these inputs and these patch bay points, but having 3.5 millimeter jacks is obviously more convenient. Final pro for the original soft pop is that it was cheaper or is cheaper than soft pop too. Beyond that, plenty of pros here. These faders are on the panel as opposed to being on the sides here, which wasn't very convenient. The sequencer here is way more powerful, way more sequences, easier to program. The multiple scales and scalar by far more comprehensive on soft pop too. The new pop and pixel mod control, very convenient. So overall, a major and substantial improvement over the original soft pop, but obviously this comes at a cost. So with that said, let's take a look at some pros and cons for soft pop too. Overall, on the cons side, if you're looking for a quote, regular subtractive semi-modular monosynth, there are plenty of other options with more oscillators, more envelopes, LFOs, and so on, priced at this price or less. This synth is for you if you want a synth made by people who think very differently from others, if you want to dig into the patch bay and want to embrace the cross mods and this very different way of using quantization within a synth. So let's say that you are one of these people that are interested in embracing the different. What are some of the things to be mindful of? First question that I had when I saw it was, is it too shifty? And if you look at the manual, the list of shift combos is very long and intimidating. However, when you actually use the synth, they kind of fall into place and make sense. You edit the scales using the scale buttons and arrow keys. You edit the clock divisions using the tempo button and the gate buttons or the arrow keys. You choose patterns using the pattern button, choose slides using the slide button. There's a MIDI button here to choose MIDI channels. It kind of all makes sense. Now, are there some hidden shift functions you need to be aware of beyond these? Absolutely yes. Is it totally self-explanatory as is? No, but it's something you can just feel your way around. In most cases, make some mistakes until you finally get it. Beyond that, I'm using a pre-production firmware on this unit and it does have a few noticeable bugs like the first note in a sequence being slow, like I mentioned earlier, and a few other issues. There's also a very low level bleed of audio through the VCA. Again, I don't know if this is because this is a pre-production unit, a bug, or just how it is. Bastel have told me these issues will be addressed and I'll add a comment to the description if they are. Beyond that, I'm hard pressed to think of cons because it's, this is just so different. If you accept the different, this is the framework that you work with. I think the only thing that I would have liked change is you can disable all the cross mods except the low oscillator frequency cross mod to the envelope rate. It's cool for organic generative style patches, but if you want to disable it, you can't, at least to my knowledge. 
On the pros side, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Soft Pop 2 is a refreshingly original synth. It's got some pretty cool default cross mods that make for lovely organic textures and plenty of surprises along the way, and an extensive patch bay which invites you to create your own different cross mods or craziness. At first, I thought Soft Pop 2 was a relatively simple synth, but as I dug deeper, I ended up spending way more time than I thought I would, not just because it felt like I had to uncover as many of its secrets and puzzles as I could, but mainly because I kept discovering timbral nooks and crannies that I just couldn't find on other synths. So if you want a synth that will challenge and surprise you, Soft Pop 2 is well worth a look. Speaking of which, many of the tips and ideas in my ever-expanding book available to the good people who support this channel on Patreon are directly applicable to making the most out of Soft Pop 2. See a link below if you want to check it out. Hit like if this video was useful. Ring the bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.